what I thought was really, really interesting, though, about the way we lined up was that in my head, when I picked Jorginho in my midfield going into this game, I thought that Jorginho would play as the six. And that what that would mean is that Declan Rice would have to play a slightly different role. So he wouldn't be playing necessarily as an eight. He'd be playing as a kind of hybrid between a six and an eight, because my worry about Jorginho is not what he does in possession. It's not what he does with the ball at his feet. It's not about his mentality. It's not about his intelligence. It's nothing to do with that. It's just about the fact that he can't cover ground as quickly and isn't as strong as someone like Declan Rice. So I've always said that you can kind of facilitate Jorginho as a six if you've got Declan Rice close to him. And that was what I expected to happen because that's what we've seen before. But Mikel Arteta made a really, really interesting tweet today. He didn't play Jorginho as the six. He played Rice as the six. And Jorginho was playing slightly to the left. Now, with Jorginho playing slightly to the left and having that extra sort of very good in possession type midfielder able to break lines, what that meant was that Zinchenko or whoever played at left back didn't need to invert as much. And that gave us a slightly different balance. One of the things I noticed in the first half, and I was working with my colleague, uh, Zavi Bird, today, and, and I turned to him and I said it a few minutes into the game. When Arsenal were pressing Liverpool, what you saw was Havertz pressing and Martin Odegaard stepping out of the midfield and going and joining Kai Havertz to, to, put, uh, to press as a front two. And then it became a flat four in midfield. Saka would tuck back in, Martinelli would tuck back in, and Jorginho and Rice would play as a duo, side by side, square with each other. And it gave us a whole different dynamic. When we played against Liverpool in the Cup, I thought we did a really, really good job of getting in between the lines. Today, though, I thought we approached it a little bit differently. Liverpool would have picked up on what we did well last time out, and they would have been much more alert, much more switched on to it. So we needed to vary things up a little bit. And what we did a great job of doing was using Gabriel Martinelli on that left-hand side to stretch the two Liverpool centre-backs. Now, you're, you're probably thinking, well, what about the right-back? Well, Trent Alexander-Arnold is so forward-thinking that he will get caught high up the pitch. He is so progressive in his thinking and has been playing in midfield quite a bit of late. He would constantly drift infield or he'd push right up on that right-hand side. And the great thing about having both Jorginho and Rice in that team meant we had a little bit more uh, defensive cover in midfield, which allowed one of them to go out to the left and support. And also with Zinchenko not having to invert, he could kind of stay um, closer to where his position on paper is. And that me meant that we could leave Martinelli all the way up the pitch all the time. And very, very often in the first half, when Arsenal won the ball back, whether it be through a centre-back, whether it be through a centre midfielder, the first thought was get it out to Martinelli on the left-hand side. Because when you do that, what happens is, is that Ibrahima Konate, who's playing right centre-back, he has to come across. He has to come across and deal with the Martinelli threat because more often than not, if the turnover's quick and the ball is worked out to that left-hand side nice and sharply, Martinelli is in space. Trent Alexander-Arnold isn't there. So Konate has to go across and that splits the centre-backs. And when you're defending, you never, ever want your centre-halves to have such great distances in between them. And that's what kept happening to Liverpool in that first half. Um, someone in the chat says, MOTD, watch along. I'm recording MOTD and I will go and watch it uh, immediately after this. The reason I wanted to do this now um, rather than in the morning is because I've got a really, really busy morning and I didn't want this to go out any later um, than first thing. Those of you that listen on audio, I want you to wake up in the morning and see the notification on your podcast app. For those of you on YouTube, I know we've got lots of viewers in the States and in various other parts of the world, India, Africa, etc., etc. And I know that the time um, this time isn't too bad for some of you. I know for others, it's terrible in the States. So it's pretty good, I guess. But yeah, I'm talking about the centre-halves being split by the way that we approach the game, by the gap being left by Trent Alexander-Arnold, constantly being exposed by Martinelli, which meant that Konate had to keep getting dragged out there. We created um, one really, really good standout opportunity before we eventually broke the deadlock. And that was... Um, created by David Raya, actually. He came out, caught across, 
And he did exactly what he did against Crystal Palace um, a couple of weeks back, where he just launched it um, out to the left-hand side for Martinelli, who carried it, got his head down, and he just went. Now, Canate is no slouch, but Martinelli took him right to the byline from, I think he picked the ball up just inside his own half, Martinelli. Took Canate all the way to the byline, put in a ferocious cross into um, sort of around about the six-yard box, and in came Bukayo Saka. Brilliant run, by the way. When we talked about what we were doing really, really well last season, we kept talking about the way that Jesus would drop deep and vacate those central spaces, leaving them open for the wingers to come into from outside. And that's why they were so difficult to pick up. And we saw a bit of that here. It was a counter-attacking situation, a little bit different, but Martinelli gets down the left-hand side. He puts the cross in and Saka had the goal at his mercy. He really, really, really needed to score there. And I remember at that moment thinking, it's going to be one of those days, isn't it? Where we're going to create lots and lots of opportunities. We're not going to take them. And we're going to get done with a sucker punch down the other end. And then Bukayo Saka did score. And Arsenal took the lead. It was a deserved lead. Arsenal were by far the better team today. Um, I think throughout, with the exception of maybe a 10-minute period, um, right at the start of the second half. But we'll come on to that in a bit. I want to do this in chronological order. So on 14 minutes, Bukayo Saka scores. Ball gets played uh, into Odegaard. Lovely ball around the corner. And there was uh, Kai Havertz to pick it up and run through on goal. And I was thinking, come on, Kai. Come on, Kai. Stick it in the bottom corner. Come on, Kai. Come on, come on, come on. Um, what does he do? He hits it straight at Allison with one of the most underwhelming finishes you'll ever see. But thankfully, Bukayo Saka was up alongside him, was supporting. And when the ball broke to him, he took a touch to compose himself and then put it into the back of the net. Arsenal had broken the deadlock and taken the lead. And thank God that Havertz did. Um, oh, sorry, thank God that Saka did put that away, because if he didn't, can you imagine uh, what people would have been saying about Kai Havertz? I'm going to save the chat about his individual performance for a little bit later on. I just want to run through some of the key events. Then, of course, right on the stroke of half time, um, 45 uh, minutes plus three, so 48th minute, Gabriel scores an own goal that puts Liverpool back on level terms. And the truth was they didn't deserve it. They really, really didn't. And it felt to me like when that goal went in, all the life, all the positivity, all the energy that the fans had created and the players were feeding off in that first half just completely evaporated, disappeared, left the building. When you can see the goal at that point in a game, it's quite difficult. When you've been really, really on top and then you concede right on the stroke of half-time, it can be a punch in the gut. That's what it feels like. 